Hey, uh, th thank you everybody for joining us. Um, we're excited to have this program, uh, Play With Your Cat, the essential guide to interactive play for a happier, healthier feline. Um, we have Dr. Michael Maria Delgado here with us uh, to present. And Dr. Michael Maria Delgado is a leading cat behavior consultant and animal behavior scientist whose research has appeared in scientific journals and veterinary textbooks. She co-authored Total Cat Mojo with Jackson Galaxy, and she has been featured in outlets including the New York Times, Atlantic, and the BBC. Delgado lives in Sacramento, California with her boyfriend, Scott, and their three happy rescue cats, Coriander, Professor Scribbles, and Ruby. And we'll get to her presentation. All right, thanks so much. Um, you will see lots of videos of my cats um, and other cats in this presentation. So first I just wanted to thank everybody for being here. And if you are having any um, issues with like Zoom, like you can't see all of the slides, please uh, message Jeff and he'll let me know so that I can try to stop weird Zoom things from happening. But um, yeah, so thanks for being here. I'm going to uh, be talking about my book, Play With Your Cat, and also just cat play in general. I mean, pretty much most of the things I'm going to talk about are in my book in some form or another, but we're, we're going to be working through some things with video and um, I'll have time to answer questions at the end. So if you have questions about anything you see, please don't hesitate to um, hold that thought until the end. And um, I apologize, I think some things might be popping up at the top of the screen. So um, I am hopefully not making that worse. Okay, so I'm just gonna get started. Um, all right, so why are we here? I am going to be talking to you about interactive play with cats and I'll start by just defining what is play. I'm going to talk about why cats play and really relate it to one of their natural behaviors, which is hunting. I'll talk about, what, about why cats benefit from play. And then I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about some of my favorite tools for play, including toys. And I'll end with my top tips for successful play. Um, so hopefully we're gonna have a lot of fun. Okay, so let's start with just defining play. What is it? Um, you know, I think it, it's interesting because all animals that have been studied play. And I'm just going to play a short clip of a video of a squirrel. So I did my PhD dissertation on squirrel behavior. And um, hopefully this video is playing. But um, one of the things I observed during my research was that a lot of squirrels would play with branches. So they would kind of roll around on the ground and play with twigs, hop on them, jump on them. And it was absolutely ridiculous. Cutest thing pretty much that I'd ever seen. Um, so I would always drop what I was doing and start videotaping squirrels. But, um, you know, we see animals play wherever we look for it. So there have been studies of play from, of course, humans and other primates to cows, to cats and dogs, to bees. And all of these animals play. And one of the foremost scientists in the study of animal play is Dr. Gordon Burkhart. And he studied play behavior in reptiles. So if you think like, hmm, do all animals play? His like life's work was really looking at play in a species that probably most of us would say, do snakes play, do turtles play? The answer is yes. So th then the question becomes, well, how do we know it's play? And there's really no one agreed upon definition of play, which makes it kind of challenging to say with any kind of consensus, like this is play. You know, we often think we know it when we see it. Like I look at this squirrel and this looks very playful to me. So Dr. Gordon Burkhart did come up with these criteria for play that most scientists say, yeah, this is a reasonable definition of play. One being that it seems to lack function. And that is kind of a subjective statement. And we use the word, you know, lacks complete function because it may have some function, right? If all animals play, then play has evolved across many species. It must serve some purpose that is beneficial to us. Uh, play tends to look both spontaneous and pleasurable. So in this case, the squirrel just started hopping out of nowhere and bouncing around. It wasn't um, like they kind of eased into it. It was just like started bouncing around. Um, play tends to differ from a more serious form of behavior. So it can resemble a serious behavior. And you could imagine that this squirrel could be benefiting from learning about the property of branches. What happens when I bounce on a branch? What happens when I touch it with my paws? But playing with a branch on the ground is much safer than bouncing around on a branch in a tree. 
So in this respect, it could be like a practice for a more serious behavior. And we see this with other types of play. So for example, when animals play together, it often looks like a more friendly version of fighting. Um, and as we'll see with cats, play often looks like maybe a more friendly version of hunting. Play tends to be repetitious, but without stereotypy. And a stereotypy is a repetitive behavior that is usually harmful. So we see animals pacing in enclosures or over grooming. So with play, we do see repetition, but it does not appear to be um, from stress. And to further support that idea, play tends to happen when animals feel safe and are not experiencing a lot of stress. So we can assume that this little squirrel is feeling pretty comfortable in, in his or her environment, not feeling threatened by hawks or dogs or anything. And in fact, they're just having a good time. So let's talk about how cats hunt because we need to understand how they hunt to understand how they play. Cats are what we call stock and ambush hunters, meaning that they are going to um, detect prey and then spend quite a bit of time and energy kind of determining like the right opportunity to hunt it. So the stalking part is just a lot of watching, a lot of sneaking up. And then the ambush part is like, boom, they're going to like dive in there and they have one chance to capture their prey. And if they miss it, they miss it. Um, so we do see this type of behavior often when we're playing with our cats too. As far as how hunting develops in cats, we know that mom plays an important role in that she does introduce live prey to kittens. Um, but the interesting thing, and you may have heard kind of an old wives tale that if a cat doesn't learn to hunt from their mom, they won't be able to hunt. And that is not true. And that kind of ties back to this idea of like, hunting is very important for cat survival. So they need to be able to hunt even if something happens to mom. So hunting is so important to cats that they will get there even if mom never shows them. They will take longer to learn and they may take longer to get good at it, but they will still get there. We know that hunting is triggered by certain things in the environment, sounds like rustling noises that might mean there's a bird hopping around in some leaves or a, you know the visual of a mouse running across a field. So when cats detect these things that tell their brain like, ooh, praise in the area, they kind of go right into that stalking mode and to support this, they have a much different sensory world than we do. And that's probably one of the hardest things for us as cat owners to understand is how our cats experience the environment. We know that their sense of hearing is much more exquisite than ours. Their vision is very different from ours. So they have very poor color vision, but they have excellent detection of motion in low light conditions. They can really amplify light in they can't see in total darkness, but when there's just a little bit of light, their eye can really magnify the effects of that so that they can see movement. But if you look at images of what cats see versus what people see, the colors tend to be very washed out and blurry, but in a low light scene, the clarity is quite strong. So it's, it's very different than us. And of course, cats have other senses that are important to hunting. Their whiskers play a huge role and their whiskers allow them to detect air movement. And like that cat in the bottom photo with the bird in their mouth, their whiskers are going to help them determine if the bird is still struggling and alive or if the prey has been successfully killed. So when we look at how cats play, it basically looks like how they hunt. And so that kitty on the top is doing the classic butt wiggle that you may have seen with your own cats, but she's doing maybe a modified version of stalking and rushing. We don't see maybe as much stalking in this particular example, though, as I'll show you later, some cats will stalk for quite a bit before they pounce on a toy. But again, same concept, stalking, ambush, boom. Cats are also inst uh, instigated to play by specific stimuli. So the size of the prey or toy can be an important factor, which is true of hunting as well. They tend to prefer to hunt smaller animals than larger. And the more similar to prey a toy is, the more likely a cat is to hunt or play with it. So um, when you're selecting toys for your cats, you do wanna think about how this might resemble uh, something they would naturally hunt. So all of their senses are tuned into play, just like they are to hunting. So what we see is that between play and hunting, there's all these overlaps. And because of that, we actually now would say that play is part of the hunting or predation spectrum. And you may have heard you know, that cats play with their prey and that's a bit of a misnomer. It does make it sound like cats are torturing their prey and what they're really doing is being hesitant. So that 
play with prey when it's a live animal like a rat, um, a cat can get hurt pretty seriously by a rat. So they're going to be a little more cautious and they might do a lot of behaviors that to us look kind of playful or goofy because they're kind of bobbing their heads and tapping and tossing. And they're really just trying to protect their face and not get bitten. So they're um, kind of like, ew, are you gonna turn around and bite me? Or can I push you around so that your face is facing the opposite direction? But what we see between play and hunting is that they are both influenced by a lot of the same things. So cats are more likely to play when they're hungry and they're more likely to hunt when they're hungry, which makes sense as far as the hunting is concerned. Um, we also know again that cats are attracted to similar qualities between prey and toys. So from this, we can safely conclude that as far as cats are concerned, when we engage in play behavior with them, and I call this interactive play, right? And that's really where you have, you know, there's a human holding a stick with something on the end of it and your cat is playing with the thing on the end of the stick. Um, that we are engaging in a pseudo predatory or hunting simulation. We're really giving them an opportunity to express this hunting instinct in a way that doesn't kill any birds or mice, um, but you know happens in the safety of our homes. So I, I hinted at um, the fact that play and hunting are both influenced by hunger. And I'm gonna talk about a few um, research papers that have come out, These some of these are very old. And to be honest, a lot of the research in cat play is primarily in kittens, but this is one study that was done in adult cats uh, by Sarah Hall and John Bradshaw. John Bradshaw has written some terrific books about cat behavior. So um, I definitely recommend checking his work out. Um, but in this study, they basically tested how likely cats were to sniff and bite a toy, uh, depending on both the cat's hunger and the size of the toy. So just to explain kind of what's happening in these two graphs. So on the bottom, on what we call the um, X axis, we have the time since the cat last ate. So the cats, at, it says zero hours, they just ate, they're not hungry. But the cats where it says 16 hours, they have not eaten for 16 hours. So they are very hungry. And a sniff is considered a more inhibited approach to a prey or toy, like you're, you're sniffing it, but you're not quite ready to bite. Where a bite is like, okay, I'm going for it. I'm killing this thing. And so what we see is that when the toy is large, so these white bars are large toy interactions. If the toy is large and the cat is very hungry, then they go to sniffing, right? So that tells us that they are hesitant. They're interested, they're very hungry, but the toy is large. So they're like, not sure. When we look at the biting behavior, it's interesting because again, these cats are not hungry on the um, left-hand side of this second graph. Um, if it's small, in either case, they're much more likely to bite it. So again, that shows confidence. I'm hunting, I'm killing this. It's tiny and I'm going for it. Whereas when the toy is large, even though they're very hungry, they're not very likely to bite the toy. So this tells us the cats are more comfortable with a smaller toy. So a mouse sized toy as opposed to a rat sized toy regardless of their hunger, but they are more likely to sniff a larger toy. If they are really hungry, they're just not confident enough to bite it. Now, another important thing that um, Sarah Hall and John Bradshaw studied was the effect of what we call habituation. And habituation is basically just the tendency to stop responding to something with repeated exposure. So for example, if you move somewhere and there's like a train, like a subway or something outside your home, you move in and you're like, oh my God, the subway's so loud or this traffic's so loud. After a couple of weeks, you don't even hear it, right? You have habituated to those sounds. And so the same thing happens to cats when we're playing with toys. And so to test this, uh, Dr. Bradshaw and Dr. Hall basically presented cats with the same toy multiple times. Um, so they did four trials. So on the first three trials, they presented the same toy. Um, so in this case, in the illustration, um, it's a white, piece of fur tied to a string. And by trial three, the with the presentation of the same toy, the cat has lost interest. On trial four, they present the cat with an identical toy, but it's a different color, but it's the same size, same composition. It's a little piece of fur tied to a string. And the cat is suddenly very interested in playing again. So when we look at the data from this study, and I'll try to walk you through this so it makes sense, um, so we have, again, three trials, I'm sorry, four trials. So we have trial one, they didn't include the data for trial three because it basically just 
goes in a successively decreased response. And then trial four is when the new toy is introduced. And then they tested like, well, what happens if we wait 25 minutes between presenting the toy or 15 minutes between presenting the toy or 45 minutes between presentations or five minutes. So they tested all these different intervals to see if like there was any effect of like how long you waited before you presented the toy again. Um, in every case, so we see clutches and kill bites. So a clutch would be the cat grabbing the toy and a kill bite would be the cat biting the toy. And regardless of the time between sessions, we see very clearly that between trial one and trial three, the cat has lost interest in clutching or biting the toy. But when they present the new toy, they're suddenly interested again. And this is consistent regardless of the time intervals, but it did seem like if they only waited five minutes between presentations, that the cats actually had the largest rebound effect. So what we can learn from this is that um, if you are going to like switch toys, um, five minute interval might be the, the sweet spot to get your cat excited. But it also tells us that cats do get bored of the same toy. And I can't tell you how many people say like, oh, he's bored of all of his toys. He doesn't want to play. And what this data tells us is that no, your cat still does want to play. They just want a new toy. So you want to have a lot of toys that you can rotate through so that when your cat does stop responding, they're going to still be able to, um, you know, have fun because you're going to keep the play continuing instead of just assuming, ah, oh, he's bored, let's end it now. So that's one, of, we'll talk more about this later, but um, it does, you know, really make sense based on the things I hear from cat owners about their cats getting bored, doesn't want to play anymore. Um, and that really, we can kind of stop that, um, you know, session from ending too soon by just bringing out a different toy. And this touches on another important part of hunting behavior and play behavior that Sarah Hall also wrote about in this book chapter. And this is a theoretical chapter, so there was no study per se, but what she posited was that when a cat hunts something, and I'm sorry, this is gonna get a little, get a little gory, but when they're killing an animal, um, the animal changes temperature, the animal loses blood their skin changes, they lose feathers, there's physical change in that body. And we like to buy toys that are very sturdy and do not change because we don't wanna keep replacing them. So what's the kind of happy medium there? For me, it's providing your cat with some toys that they can shred and destroy. And that usually means cardboard, paper, tissue, paper towels, craft paper, whatever that um, you know we can provide for them, but these things do allow them to do that kind of shredding and destroying. And then the toy or you know object that they're interacting with does change its physical form, which kind of supports that idea of like, I'm killing this, it's changing, it's falling apart, I'm a successful hunter, cool. So really think about ways that you can provide your cat opportunities to kind of destroy some of their toys without you know breaking your bank. Okay, so I wanna talk about why play for cats is so important because it is an often neglected aspect of cat care, right? Like everybody knows you gotta feed your cat, you gotta give them fresh water, you gotta clean their litter box, hopefully every day. Um, we gotta take them to the vet at least once a year. But um, you know, people often forget about the cat's other needs. And I really like this model that was created by a bunch of cat experts um, over 10 years ago now called the five pillars of a healthy feline environment. And the thinking behind this is that we're really trying to promote not just physical health in our cats, but good emotional health, which of course supports their physical health. We are trying to provide them with an environment that they can thrive in, do natural behaviors, and that by doing so, we're helping reduce stress and preventing behavior problems. And I can tell you as a behavior consultant, so I help people who are already experiencing behavior problems with their cats, it's much easier to prevent a problem than solve one. So it's really good to be proactive rather than waiting until it seems like your cat is depressed or stressed and then trying to add a bunch of stuff to the environment to make your cat happy. So the five pillars are um, really a kind of updated cat specific model of animal welfare. And some of you may have heard of the five freedoms. These were developed in the 1970s for farm animals. And really the idea was like animals should not suffer just because we're using them, right? They should be free from pain, free from distress. And they were very much focused on preventing negative experiences. Since then, we've kind of moved more towards, well, let's talk about what animals should experience, not just what they shouldn't. And so for cats, the five pillars 
are um, providing safe spaces. So that means hiding spaces, um, having multiple and separated key resources. So really distributing your cat's things throughout the home, not just putting them all in one corner. Uh, number three is opportunity for play and predatory behavior. So I'm a big fan of that pillar. Um, positive social interaction. So that means with people or other animals in the home and also respecting the cat's sense of smell, which is much more sensitive than ours. So this is kind of my like model that I always turn to as like, what am I trying to help cats experience? What will give them the best life in any home environment? And if you follow these five pillars, you're off to an excellent start. And as far as like why play and predatory behavior specifically, well, I've already told you it is a natural behavior, right? So play is really hunting behavior. We have not domesticated cats to stop hunting. Um, we don't like hunting. And certainly if they live indoors, they don't have a lot of opportunities to hunt. But I know that if a moth or a fly comes into my house, all of my cats are on high alert. They are ready to go. So even though they do not um, wander outside, uh, when the opportunity to hunt uh, a bug comes into the house, they that instinct is right there. So it's a natural behavior for cats. So by playing with them, we're giving them an opportunity to express a natural behavior, not just suppress it. Um, so we believe that play is good for physical health. It can promote exercise. It's good for emotional health. There's certainly plenty of evidence that enrichment and exercise can prevent cognitive decline and help animals with stress and coping with stressful situations. And for me too, it's like an opportunity to bond with your cat. You know, if you have cats that are not especially cuddly, then sometimes play is a great way to have a, have a really nice relationship with them and build a bond with them. We also see from research that cats play less when they're stressed. So cats in shelters play less. Cats who have health problems play less and declawed cats play less. So these are all conditions where we anticipate that cats are experiencing a fair amount of stress. And since we see less play, we can assume that there is a relationship where stress does um, suppress play. So if your cat is not playing, then you wanna make sure that there's not stressors in the environment because it could be a sign that there's something wrong with your cat's environment or social relationships. Okay, so moving ahead, um, hopefully I've convinced you all that Play is important, play is natural. So let's talk about how to play with your cat. And I'm gonna start with um, choosing some of the right tools for play. And I'm gonna talk first about toys and then props and then other things in your environment. I'm a big fan of kind of setting a scene for play. So let's talk first about the toys. Um, and I wanted to just also give a shout out um, the illustrations. A lot of the illustrations in this presentation and in my book are by a very fabulous artist, Lily Chin. Um, and this is an example of some of her art, um, but okay. So interactive wand toys, like I mentioned before, human holding some kind of stick with something hanging off the end. That's something on the end we call a lure and a hunting lure, right? So when we're looking at the lures, we want to think about the major prey categories for cats. And this is not exhaustive, um, but if you do birds, you do mice, you do bugs and you do snakes, um, you're off to a pretty good start. But of course, cats will hunt like squirrels and rabbits and stuff. But um, typically, these four are often very popular with cats. And I have examples of some of the toys that I like that fall in those categories. But there's plenty of options out there for all of these categories. And to be honest, there's a lot of great toys on Etsy. Like I feel like now I have to go more towards the um, kind of crafters as far as getting good cat toys than necessarily going to the pet store because a lot of the Pet store toys are not necessarily as well made as I would like, or they're not as creative, but that's just my opinion. But I think the most important thing is to have choice and variety, because as I talked about, cats get bored of the same toy. Now you don't necessarily have to buy pen sticks with something hanging off the end, but if you have a good wand toy where you can exchange the lure on the end, then you can kind of turn one toy into an infinite number of toys just by either buying or making things to attach to the end. The other thing that's helpful to know is, is your cat a generalist or a specialist? And there was a study where scientists basically followed cats. They were owned cats, so um, people who let their cats go outside. The scientists followed the cats and basically spied on them and watched their hunting behavior. And what they found is that some cats were generalists, meaning if there was prey and it moved, the cat would go for it. And then there were some cats who were generalists, sorry, specialists, who really preferred um, one prey type and they would always 
wait longer to get those prey and just would proportionately kill more of those animals. So if you know your cat's really a birder, um, you know, I certainly would recommend having a couple of other style lures, but you might want to have more feathers than if your cat is more into the bugs. And keep in mind, the more prey-like, the more attractive it's going to be to your cat. So that could mean, I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean how it looks. Um, and certainly if you go to the pet store, you'll see like, there's toys shaped like avocados and tacos and all kinds of things that cats wouldn't hunt. Um, they're cute and they're small, um, so they may still appeal to our cats. And if we think about their senses, things that might be appealing to them might be the feeling of the um, whatever the toy is made out of. So maybe it feels like a bug wing, like it's kind of crispy, or maybe it's a feather. So it feels very much like a feather. Maybe it's furry. So it feels like a mouse. Um, the color, again, not as important to cats. They see more in the blue-yellow spectrum and not so much red-green. So the, um, the catnip lemon looks like a lemon, but the, um, the taco may look mostly gray. Um, but you do want to think about, yeah, there, does it make sound? How does it feel? How does it look when we're choosing toys for our kitties? Okay, now I use a lot of props in my play. So I'm going to show you a few different ones and how my cats respond to them. So um, in this first video, I'm using a toy called the Bamboozler, which is kind of a snake-like toy. Um, and, um, and then it's inside this um, thing that's called the ZZ Cheese. I got it on Chewy. It's just a play mat with holes in it. Um, it kind of looks like cheese and you can button it into different configurations. My cats really like it. Um, I'm a big fan of hiding toys inside under things and all the holes let them kind of poke their paws through or get inside it and um, hunt through it. So um, to me this is like a great fun way to make the play more exciting than just having the toy is by adding the play mat on. There's a towel. I use a lot of towels because they're we have a ton of them and they're washable and our cats like to play on them. It creates a little padding and um, so again that's the um, bamboozler. So it's just kind of like a it's really just a piece of like like a rope kind of thing attached to a stick. I also like to create hunting blinds. So a hunting blind is anything that uh, hunters hide behind. This is something I posted on Instagram. So um, I, I don't think most of my videos have text, but this one does. So I just draped a towel over a chair um, and this gives cats cover. So while they're hunting and you know if they're outdoors, that might be grass or a shrub or a human made structure. Um, but they really like to get behind something while they're stalking and feel like they're not detected. So I like to, you know, drape a towel over a chair or over a box and then use that to um, kind of entice my cat to peek out to get the toy, go back and hide again and then pop out suddenly. And then I think there might be, yeah, his cat under the hide and then one watching on top. So a lot of hijinks in our house. Okay, here's more props. So also like my power move is moving the stick end of the toy under like a mat or a towel or a rug, whatever. So on the left-hand side, that's my cat Ruby. And I'm just moving the stick end toy, the stick end of the toy underneath this little welcome mat. And most cats go for this move. So if your cat's tough to play with, this is my recommendation is try the stick end of the toy under something. Okay, in the middle, what do we have going on here? Oh yeah, so um, I'm, like I mentioned, towels and blankets, really great for sliding if you have a hardwood floor. Let's watch that one more time because it's really funny. Um, so yeah, my cats like to run and slide across the floor on towels. I think it's hilarious. Okay, and then on the right-hand side, we have the ripple rug. And if you don't have a ripple rug, it's similar to that cheese play mat, um, but it's a little nicer as far as like quality. It has like rubber backing on the bottom half that prevents it from sliding around. And the top half has Velcro, so you can kind of shape it into different configurations and it's got holes that are big enough for your cat to go through so they can go inside it and hide and you know hunt the toy from inside or you can put the toy under the holes and they can hunt from the outside. So it's very versatile and um, I love it. My cats love it. Um, we just like with toys, we rotate all of these props so they're not out all of the time. We bring out different ones and then we'll put the ripple rug away for a week and then we'll bring out the mat for a couple days and then we'll bring out some towels. So I like to uh, maintain a lot of variety, um, both with toys and props. Okay. Um, 
Okay, my computer's freaking out. So we'll just give it a second to stop freaking out. Um, okay. This might be a good time to take a question because I think um, my computer is like unhappy. So Jeff, I don't know if you have any questions, but if you want to throw in my way, I'm going to try to um, get my PowerPoint back on track. Oh, I did have a question about what colors do cats like? Yes. So they can see in the blue yellow end of things. Um, outside of that is pretty tough for them. So um, if you have, it's not that they can't see them, they just look gray. So it's not like they, they're, they're not blinded to those colors. It's just that they're not going to look as vibrant and they're going to look probably more like a mouse. So if um, if you do get toys that are, you know, bright red, they're probably gonna look very drab to your cat. I apologize. So, okay, my I'm going to restart my PowerPoint and we'll be back in two seconds. Um, so thank you for bearing with me. It, there's always a technological challenge, but we're gonna get through it together. And, okay, let me pause the next slide and get us back on track. Okay. I don't know what's going on with my computer. It's pausing again. I'm sorry, everybody. Any other questions? Like I said, bring them on down. I'm gonna try this one more time. PowerPoint is freaking out. Questions, anybody? We got a question um, from Little Weirdos. One of my cats loves to chase our garden hose, the water coming out of it. Is there a risk of this being frustrating because he can't catch the water? That's really interesting. I have to be honest, that's a new one. So um, I'm curious, like, are you outside with your cat playing with the, um, with the hose? Um, because, um, so I, I guess what I'm unclear on is if he's, like if you're moving the hose and he wants to play with the water or you're, is the water on? Like, <laughs> I feel like we need to talk more about this um, because yeah, I'm, I'm curious. And also like, that's a new one for me. Um, so yeah, if you want to elaborate more and we can um, get back to that. Can everybody see the video again? Jeff, are we good? Yes, I can see the video now. Yep. Okay, perfect. So in this case, um, this is just illustrating that cats really like to play under doors. I don't know if anybody's noticed this, like if you roll a toy and I, we happen to have poorly fitting doors in my house. So I made a fake under the door toy for my cats out of a shoe box. I basically just cut a little slit at the bottom of the shoe box. I put some tissue paper in there. I put some toys in there and then um, I let my cats dig in there because I'd observed that they really seem to like to stick their paws under the door. And it turns out that they also like to stick their paw in this little hole in the box. So if you have a shoe box, you can make your cats a little like fake under the door thing. Or if you have a house like mine where none of the doors close properly, then you can just use the doors. But I kind of wanted to test this as a proof of concept that yes, cats would like to play with this if you built this. And it's very cheap and easy. Okay. Cat trash. Um, so I posted a picture of like, cause my house looks like this a lot, um, <laughs> which is just that we have boxes of like tissue paper and craft paper that's all crumpled up. And um, I posted that picture on Instagram and every, like a lot of people are like, oh yeah, my living room looks like that too. And somebody called it cat trash. And I thought that was the best name for this. My cats love cat trash. So we don't leave it like this all the time, but I would say at least once a week, we bring out the box and we pull out all of the paper and our cats love to get in there. They love to play in it. I think it's the tactile sensation. I think it's the sound. Um, I think they like the ability to hide in there and also that the toy kind of hides in these areas. So if you do have like a large box, um, we happen to subscribe to like a toilet paper delivery. And so the box is pretty huge. It's perfect for stuffing a bunch of paper in there and then pulling it out. And then, like I said, they like to nest in there. So this is, um, this is a nice play prop that's very cheap and easy. It just, you know, and then you can just put all the paper back in and put it in the closet until next time. Okay, so putting it all together, like 
I know like it probably sounds like my house is kind of a mess and sometimes it is I'll be honest um, but it's for the cats <laughs> but what I like is just really taking advantage of all the things in your environment this is another illustration from my book and thinking about like how can I make the play move from one part of the house to another so I'm going to start on the cat tree and then maybe we use the couch as like you know a highway and I've got a tunnel and a ripple rug and I've got the scratching post tipped on its side for the cats that like to lay on their back and play with it and I've got boxes and toys. And this is really like an environment that you can play with multiple cats in and they maybe all have their little area that they like or they can go from one spot to the other. But, you know, I think that, um, and hopefully none of you are like completely horrified and like, oh, she wants me to make my house look terrible. You don't have to do this all the time, but it can be really fun to just turn your house into like a cat playground. Um, so that's all I'll say about it for now. Okay. Uh, moving on, I'm going to blast through my top tips for effective play so then we can, uh, there's still a lot of videos to watch, but um, then if you have questions, we can get through them. But this is, I mean, and I have changed this a little bit because I this talk is a little bit different than other ones I've given, I tried to add some new videos and change things up. So I did change one of my top 10 tips, but, um, you know, they're all kind of related. So the first is just mimicking the hunting experience. I think I've convinced you by now about, you know, the features of hunting, cats are stock and ambush hunters, and we want to really um, bring that to our play. We want to think about things that attract cats to hunting. So the, the crevices like under the door, the rustling sounds like tissue paper. And remember that cats eyes are kind of tuned into movement along the horizontal plane. So that can be a really good way to get them started is just drag the toy kind of a few feet away um, across the floor. And also remember that cats are not necessarily um, they're in it for the long game is basically, so you want to pace things because I think sometimes people think play should just be like nonstop backflips and the cat's running around and like super excited. And again, thinking about the stalking and the slow part and the watching. And so you're going to have kind of these different, um, ups and downs in your play. It's not going to just be like full blast for a really short period. It might be a longer play session with more ups and downs of their energy. Move the toy like prey. So, you know, I'd say the biggest thing that I saw when I worked at the animal shelter that I worked at was like people would poke the cat with the toy, which um, I think they were just trying to get the cat's attention, but it was mostly making the cat irritated and not engaging the cat in play. So you want to think like, what would a bird do? What would a mouse do? And I can tell you they would not walk up to a cat and poke them. So I'm um, really think more about like, I'd be like hiding and running away or um, skittering away or trying to fly away. Um, and also think like, okay, don't make it too hard for your cat. Like let them catch the toy and put it in their mouth and feel it. And also don't make it too easy. So, you know, you want to, again, let them kind of engage in some of those hunting behaviors. Again, use all of their senses. Here's a video that um, one of my clients sent of her cats playing. And I just, this is kind of the quintessential young active cats doing amazing moves. So I just had to put this in. Look at that backflip. I love this cat so much. Um, there really should be an Olympic competition for cats doing backflips because this cat is amazing. And you can see that she's getting tired. <laughs> so, you know, again, the, you know, this does not have to be an all day activity. You'd be amazed at what three to five minutes a day can do for your cat if you're playing with them. And then we get another guest star coming in. Um, so, you know, don't feel like, oh, I don't have the time to play with my cat an hour a day. I'm not asking you to play with your cat an hour a day. Most cats, some cats would like an hour of play a day, but most cats are going to be fine with, you know, a few minutes here and there. Okay, um, tip number three, don't be afraid to go slow. All right, so I'm not going to play, so this is actually two versions of the same video. One is just sped up and one of them is regular speed. So on the left hand side, this is the regular speed. And um, I'm moving the toy really slow. And this is a I think it's a six minute yeah it's a six minute video we're not going to watch the whole thing um but basically the point i want to get across is that a lot of this time i'm barely moving the toy so this is the four times sped up version on the right that's moving now and you can see now she's moving a lot faster but just to give you a sense of like how long it can take to get a pounce out of a cat because i'm barely moving this toy and a lot of people get really bored at this phase because we just want to whip the feather around and have the cat do a few backflips and get tired. And in this case, I'm barely doing anything. And yes, it gets boring. Yes, sometimes I am checking my Instagram while I'm doing this, but I really try to focus and not be like, um, you know, not paying attention to what my cats are doing. But yeah, it's like, 
is she playing? She is playing. So that's the thing that I think a lot of people don't realize is that even though their cat is barely moving, this is play. As long as the cat is engaged and keeps watching, even if that final pounce never happens, um, it was probably still play. And just so you know, there is going to be a pounce. So, um, but it took a long time. So this was six minutes of me barely moving the toy or one pounce. You thought, oh, she, you thought she's going to pounce there. Nope, not yet. Not yet. Oh, there we go. Then we get a couple more. So once she got warmed up, there were a few more pounces. I think she's going to do again, takes a little while. So really, you know, what, what I guess my message is here, like go slow. Um, often that's much more successful than going fast and don't give up too soon because your cat may actually be playing, even though you think they are not. Okay. Um, change it up. So as I mentioned before, cats get bored of the same toy. So you do want to have five to 10 interactive toys so you can rotate out the lures. So you don't need as many of the wand parts, but you want to have different things to dangle on the end. I am a fan of homemade toys. I make a ton of toys myself out of fabric and paper and whatever else I can find around the house that I can stick on the end, um, including vegetables. So my cats are actually really fond of playing with green beans. <laughs> so that's me tossing a green bean for Ruby. And then one morning I got up and my cat was playing with a potato. I don't even know how she got this potato, but she was rolling it around. So of course I grabbed my phone and started video recording her, but um, yeah, so as long as it's not garlic or onions, which are not safe for cats to consume, um, they can enjoy a little safe vegetable play. Um, as I mentioned before, give them something they can shred like paper. Um, that's a great way to give them some temporary toys that change and you can recycle them when you're done. Okay, next. Okay, meet your cat where they are. So this is really about like not having expectations that all cats are gonna do the crazy backflips like the cat a few slides ago. So um, if you have an older cat or an overweight cat, or maybe your cat has um, a disability or other special needs, um, then you may have to slow things down quite a bit and they may play while laying down. And as I like to say, even though it's not grammatically correct, playing while laying is still playing. <laughs> so um, really just like embrace that play may look a lot of different ways for different cats. And this totally kind of lazy type of play is still play and I fully endorse it. Okay, private time. So this is really about if you have multiple cats. Now I have three cats. Um, this is when they were tiny kittens. So we did play with them together quite a bit. And you'll see there's a couple like near misses here and like they're almost running into each other. Um, so I wouldn't recommend this with adult cats and certainly not adult cats that are not friendly with each other. So in most cases, if you have multiple cats, you are gonna wanna separate them for play so that they can let loose. I can't tell you how many clients have said to me like, oh, well, Fluffy just likes to watch Felix play. And when Felix is not in the room, it turns out that Fluffy really does like to play it's just that when Felix is in the room, he's hogging the toy and she feels intimidated by him. So she doesn't want to play in front of him. So we have to make sure that every cat has the opportunity to play. Um, if you have multiple people in the house, then you can kind of split up and go into different rooms with different toys and um, play with them separately that way. But in some cases you do actually have to separate um, with a door closed between them and give each cat the opportunity to play on their own. Okay, this is after I just said, I sometimes look at my Instagram while I'm playing with my cats, but I do recommend, I'm really trying to work on like not being on devices all the time because I sit in front of a computer all day. So um, try to give play your full attention and really watch your cat's reaction because this is a time that you can um, kind of learn what they like when you're playing with them and what gets them you know, to do the stalking and leaping and jumping. And also remember that this is part of your like relationship building with your cat and also just a you know, a plea for like, you know, cats really like routine. So if you can do things around the same time each day, that really helps provide stability in their day as well. So um, yeah, try to be present when you're playing with your cat. Okay, I get asked a lot, like, when should I play with my cat? And there's no one right time. Like it really depends on you. It really depends on your cat. You know, obviously if you work out of the home, your schedule is very different than if you work in the home, um, but we can use play for behavior modification. We wanna keep in mind like cats eat after they hunt, right? They would hunt, kill the prey, eat the prey. So, just, and we also, as I mentioned before, cats are more likely to hunt if they're in play, if they're hungry. So maybe before mealtime is a great time to play with your cat. 
we can play in the evening to encourage our cats to sleep through the night. Um, and so I do recommend like playing when your cat tends to be naturally active. I think most people, if you ask like, hey, when does your cat get the zoomies? They usually know. Um, so dawn and dusk are great times to play with your cat. Um, and I do recommend playing, you know, one to three times per day. They can be very short sessions, but thinking about like how many times a day a cat would hunt, they would have to kill like eight to 10 mice a day to survive. So we can surmise that if they are not successful every time they hunt, that they would hunt at least 15 times a day, probably. So, you know, I'm not saying you have to play with your cat 15 times a day, but one to three times a day for short sessions is good. And there's actually um, a study that came out this year using accelerometers on cats' collars that looked at their activity patterns. And what was cool was that they found seasonal differences. So in the summer, cats were more active early, 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. I think a lot of us can vouch for um, when our cats tend to wake up. And then they were active at 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. And in the winter, the cats were active later in the morning, so more like 6 to 8 instead of 5 a.m. And then earlier in the evening, so 4 to 7. So we see this really nice um, pattern sensitivity to the light changes in, in the you know natural daytime cycle, um, where again, they do tend to be active at dawn and dusk and they shift that activity based on um, actually light cycles rather than absolute time of day. So these are good times to play with your cats. That's what I'm suggesting if you don't know when. Okay, uh, cooling the play down. So this is really about um, not leaving your cat too wound up. So, you know, when we exercise, we slow down at the end, bring our heart rate down. And so you wanna do the same thing with your cat. And you can allow them to um, kill the toy. So this is, um, let me turn the sound down. This was Haley. She was a shelter cat. This video is like 20 years old. So it's like back when you had to like carry a big giant camera around to film. Um, but this is Haley. She was nine, very active. Um, she was one of my favorite kitties and I had a lot of fun playing with her. But, uh, you know, we would have to end the play session, end the visit. And she had a tendency to, to bite people. So we wanted to make sure that after she got all this nice play that she was left calm. And so usually that meant leaving the toy for her, like moving it slowly and then eventually not moving it anymore. And then letting her kind of decide like, is this thing dead or not? You can see she's still like, hmm, okay, I'm done. Like she's finally had some time to wind down. Um, so you can do the same thing with your cat and then you can always give them a snack at the end to help them kind of go into a more relaxed zone. Okay. Um, Tip 10 is have fun. So this is just kind of a compendium of various, like this was my foster kitten, Orlando. He was just cute. He smelled bad. Um, but that's a cat dancer toy. So that's a classic like wire with little pieces of cardboard and um, great kind of classic cat toy um, that is very bug-like. So, um, so yeah, this is just a bunch of videos. If you've seen any of my other talks, you've probably seen some of these videos. That was my cat Beanie when she was a kitten, um, again, playing. She was very fearful. So we use play a lot to build her confidence and get her exploring the room and feeling comfortable with us. There she is later in life when she was a bit older, doing a little backflip. This is my other cat, Clarabelle. This is a classic using the couch as a freeway. Um, we used to do a lot of back and forth on the back of that particular couch. She liked that a lot. This, I cannot remember, this was a, a friend's friend's cat and she has no teeth. So you will occasionally see her tongue hanging out of her mouth, but she's okay. She just didn't have any teeth. Um, and here's, you know, using like any cat furniture you have for play. Again, playing while laying, letting the cat have some contact with the toy. This was a kitty. He had been on um, cage rest because he had a broken leg when he came into the shelter. So he was um, finally recovered and he had some issues with um, chasing people's hands and legs. And so he needed a lot of play because he had what we call play aggression. Uh, here's another. Oh, that's the DeBird. So the DeBird is a nice uh, feather toy that kind of swivels like a bird kind of fluttering around. It's got nice movement and sound. And some cats like to carry it around. Maybe some of you have cats who like to carry their toys. Here's Haley again. Um, we saw her just a second ago with her amazing backflips. This is like we're all on YouTube just watching or Instagram watching cat videos. I feel like this is like the ultimate like human activity 
is just watching videos of cats together. And hopefully you can kind of see some of the varied movements that I use when I play. You can see here, I'm gonna move the toy under the rug. Again, my secret par move. Using the cat tree to get him to climb. Paper bag, another great prop to use. I can't believe I didn't bring that up earlier, but yeah, paper bags are another um, great prop. I do recommend cutting the handles off them um, just so no kitties get their head stuck in the, in the bag's handle. Um, peacock feather, another fabulous toy. Using the toy to kind of encourage some scratching. Oh, this is the kitty that has no teeth. Sorry, it wasn't the orange one. It's this one. This is her sister. So this is also another like moving. You'll see that when, as soon as the toy moves out of sight, it becomes way more exciting. And that's um, really relevant. Cat hunting is, is very similar in that they're very attracted to crevices. And like if a cat, if a prey moves behind something, then they're suddenly much more interested. Okay, I think that's the last video. So um, I do have a free PDF download um, of this play handout that I did with Lily Chin a couple of years ago. So please um, feel free to download it, print it, email it to your friends. Um, it comes in, I think, 13 languages now. So please um, utilize this free, very cute resource is kind of a lot of my um, key tips for play, kind of a, a condensed, very condensed version of my book, which has um, a lot of pages, but um, yeah. And if you do want my book, um, it is available where books are sold. It's hopefully available at your library. And we're going to give away two copies to attendees later. So I think you'll get notified um, sometime in the near future if you're a winner. I am on the social medias. Um, please feel free to um, get in touch or follow me, say hi or whatever. And I'm ready to answer questions. Okay, so um, we had, um, just following up with the uh, cat and the, the water hose. Oh yeah, please tell me more. Um, yeah, so um, they said that um, oh, her husband will be uh, watering the trees and he mm -hmm. is chasing the stream of the water. Oh, so he's chasing the water. I mean, it's very interesting because cats kind of have a reputation for not liking water, but some cats are very attracted to water. They like to play in water. They'll put their toys in water. Um, I, you know, what do cats understand about water? I don't know. Um, like that is a very interesting question. I don't think it's a problem. So usually, you know, I do get asked a lot like, okay, well, and you know, someone may have a question about laser pointers, right? So Things, things that cats can see but can't touch or that don't kind of fit in with like how properties of the physical world are supposed to act. Um, you know, if your cat is is frustrated, um, you know, you're looking for like kind of signs of um, obsessive or actually not obsessive, we, we say compulsive in animals where they were like either constantly looking for that thing or going back to it, um, or they might be... Um, you know, acting frustrated, maybe getting aggressive. So those would be warning signs. Like if you have bird feeder outside your window and your cat just immediately like turns and like chases you or like tries to bite you, then maybe the bird feeder isn't working for your cat. But most cats are used to some level of watching but not catching prey. So, you know, they're, they kind of have a little built-in frustration tolerance because they aren't successful every time they hunt. So in fact, they have a pretty low success rate if you think about the fact that they have to... Um, you know, survive by hunting if they're living outside. So, so to me, I think it's, it's okay that they can't necessarily hunt everything they see. I think most cats are okay with watching birds at a bird feeder through a window, or most cats are okay with like some of the cat videos, but like everything, it should not be their only source of entertainment. Like if your cat's only source of entertainment is watching bird videos on TV, you've got other things you should address. Like, and rather than worrying, like, is, is this TV watching bad for my cat? Um, 
so you want to make sure that they have kind of a well-rounded kind of enrichment plan where you're again engaging all of their senses including touch but it doesn't have to be all one type of thing and certainly I don't have time to address in this talk kind of all the other great things you can do to make your cat's environment stimulating and fun and have great interactions with them um, but I think the hose is probably okay if your cat seeks it out and interacts with the hose and isn't bothered by the water it seems okay to me um, next question you also had a question about um, your opinion on kicker toys oh kicker toys yeah those are those are great um, but I tend to not use those for interactive play so again this talk was really focused on that kind of interactive where the human is involved and I don't like to hold the kicker toys because then your hand is kind of in the kick zone but um, cats love kicker toys you can you know just take a couple of tube socks and roll them up put some catnip in there and let your cats kick them or you can buy some of the really nice kicker toys that are out there um, but it's a good outlet for a hunting behavior because that is um, one of the things that cats do when they're hunting is disembowel their prey by kicking their guts open with their back legs. <laughs> so, um, which is why I don't want my hand in the mix, but yes, I'm a big fan of kicker toys. Um, I got another question. Why does my cat put his toy in the food bowl? Yeah, that's a great question. And I don't have a good um, answer for you. <laughs> so, um, you know, when we see behaviors, we assume that they have some kind of either context where it would have made sense at some point. So maybe it makes sense to the cat that since play is like hunting, I hunt and I carry my, so most cats when they hunt, they carry the prey somewhere else before they eat it. So in the cat's mind, it could be like, I carry my toy, which is prey to the place that I normally eat. So that would be my best, like most parsimonious, simple explanation is that it's just the hunting behavior sequences are happening and your cat has made certain associations with parts of that sequence, right? So um, the toy is prey and I would carry my prey to where I want to eat it and where I want to eat it is where I've learned my food is. Um, and I also had a question, uh, will the cats get frustrated if they can't catch the laser toy? Yeah, so again, um, like with anything, the laser should be used in moderation. So I'm not anti-laser, but I really think, I can't tell you how many clients, that's the only cat toy they have, and they're just sitting on the couch, you know, waving it around on the ceiling, and the cat's, like, freaking out. Um, and so the, the main thing with the laser is um, it should not be your main form of play. It should be used in moderation. You should use it as, like, an, a warm-up, and then Kind of ease into some physical toys or treats so that the hunting cycle is completed and avoid making the laser do things that wouldn't happen in real life. I think probably to the cats because again they don't see red so it probably just looks like a white light to them so it probably looks like a bug and what a lot of people do is they kind of shine the laser halfway up a wall and then just turn it off and that's not what bugs do so if you're going to play with a laser you know make it disappear under a door or behind a curtain or something don't just shine it halfway up the wall and then turn it off but um yeah use it in moderation if at all some cats do enjoy it so um i also got a question when they uh grab the prey and carry them around should we let them have to uh let them do that yeah um, i usually let them carry the toy unless they're taking it somewhere where they're going to pull it out of my hand and it's not really safe for them to like i i really am like strict on the supervision with these interactive toys because they do have strings and wires. So we want to make sure that there's not a strangulation hazard and there's not an ingestion hazard. So, but I do let them carry it because that is a natural behavior to carry their prey. And some cats really like to, to do that. Oh, and then there was a question about what's your opinion on catnip? Love it. <laughs> um, but if your cat likes, if your cat doesn't like catnip or if your cat does like catnip, I also recommend trying some of the other olfactory um, enrichment. So that would be silver vine or tatarian, honeysuckle, valerian. There's a few others that cats like, but silver vine is the one that more cats respond to actually than catnip. But, um, you know, the main thing is that you have to know how your cat responds to it. So, for example, they might become kind of aggressive. You know, they might try to bite if you if you're trying to pet them when they're enjoying catnip. Or they might try to pick fights with other cats in the home. So you just have to really be conscious of whether they're the kind of catnip kitty that gets really mellow and chills out or if they get really high strung and want to like bite everybody. But it's a great form of enrichment for them. It's safe um, and enjoyable. Um, 
tips on how to get your foster cats who are not kittens to seem playful at adoption events. They seem they just chill and some people seem to want to see activity. Uh, record videos of them and show the potential adopters the videos of them. Um, you know, the adoption site thing is very challenging. Um, certainly in the summer, they're often hot. They're not like that well air conditioned. It's afternoon when cats tend to be lazy and sleepy. So they're not going to show those kind of behaviors necessarily. And some cats get scared in those environments. So um, I mean, you can try to play with them, but if they're not into it, they're not going to. Like if it's loud and scary, there's a lot of people coming around. Um, you know, then either, like I said, show videos, have websites um, so you can show people what they're like. Um, you can do other things to get cats to show better during adoptions, like clicker training. So you can, you know, train them to do high fives or come to the front of the cage for treats. But, um, you know, it is it is challenging in certain environments, small environment, a lot of activity around noise, and it's like afternoon and often warm. So those are things that are not necessarily conducive to getting cats to do a lot of play. Um, is it normal and what is the function of yowling after a cat catches a toy <laughs> and walks around the house holding it? This yeah. is another question that I have no good answer for. Um, I get asked this one a lot and the, uh, yeah, is it normal? Yes. A lot of, well, I'd say it's typical. A lot of cats do it. Um, I, one of my cats does it. I don't know, you know, people have different theories. Um, so, you know, mom cats will like announce when they come back with prey, but that doesn't make sense in the context of male cats do this too. And they do not engage in the caretaking of their kitten. So why would they do this behavior? So that kind of rules out that explanation. Do they want attention? Maybe it's also like the saddest sounding noise. It's a very meow, um, deep kind of guttural sound. And to me, it sounds very lonely, even though I'm just being completely anthropomorphic and I don't think that's what's going through the cat's mind. One of my cats does this. Um, in fact, she did it last night. Um, it's And my cats have always done it at night, like after we go to bed. So um, yeah, I I wish that I had a great answer for you, but I think it's a really cute, funny behavior and tons of people have questions about it. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, uh, we have a couple more here. Um, uh, 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 we had a question about, um, I throw treats around my house and my cat runs for it. Is this a bad thing? Is this considered play? Um, I would say, no, it's not a bad thing. Um, for some cats, it's like the only thing they'll run for is a kibble. So um, yeah, I do this with my own cat. Um, it's great exercise. As long as they don't have any issues with like vomiting after from running around while they're snacking, which I, they don't, my cat doesn't seem to be bothered by that. Um, is it the only type of play your cat gets? Then I'd be concerned, but it's certainly an acceptable way to get your cat to exercise. I think it's playful. Another question. Any advice on keeping cat, cats separate? Mm. My little guy can open my door when I shut him away to play with the big guy. They do not get along. Yeah, I'll be honest. This one's really hard for me because my cats are siblings and they have like the worst FOMO. They hate closed doors. Um, so what I tend to do is like try to sneak in play while one of them's napping and, you know, one of them happens to come into the office and I'm like, okay, we're playing right now. Um, while the other two are like on the, out in the catio or sleeping, um, you know, door latches and also keep the cat, like, it's not meant to be a punishment. Like you're, you know, I'm having fun with your brother and you're locked in the room. So maybe set them up with like a food puzzle or some catnip or, you know, a cat video or something so that it's, um, they have something to distract them but yeah you might need a better um a better way to latch that door or do you have a friend or roommate who can help so you know one person per cat yeah it's tricky the multi-cat household can be very challenging um and then i had a question about the slides um they were available mm, just through the recording i'm sorry yeah i don't give out my slides but um the recording is going to be available so you can go back and pause or whatever and then i just had one question myself um i know this is kind of you're talking about more interactive play but um i was uh thinking about having like a you know um like a cat you know like maze or whatever out, outside uh you mm. know one of those things you can buy on amazon um if you have your cat like outside and they're an indoor cat, I, will they get a taste for being like outside? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, so I think um, it's true. Once they have a taste of the outside, it can be hard to 
bring that back in. Um, but a lot of cats are perfectly happy with limited outdoor exposure, whether it's on a harness or in an, you know, some type of enclosure. So I have a catio for my cats and my cats definitely love it. They spend a lot of time out there, but they don't ever seem to want more. Right. So they're, they're pretty content with that. My last cat, we took her out in our backyard on a, har on a harness. Um, but yeah, if you're going to kind of open that Pandora's box, you want to be able to commit to it. So maybe if you're going to take your cat out on a harness, you want to, you know, be able to usually like kind of do it every day, more or less. Or if you're going to take your cat out in the little enclosure um, maze, like you're probably going to want to do it every day because what will happen is they're going to start asking for it. And if you only do it when they meow for it, you're going to create a bad habit. Um, so if you do it around the same time each day, it's part of their routine and they know when to expect it. And then maybe you do a little training, like you have to sit quietly and then I'll put your harness on, or then I'll take you out in your little um, tunnel. And so you're kind of building in a routine where your cat knows what to expect and what to do to make that happen, as opposed to um, just screaming her head off in the hopes that you will eventually like open the door and like take your cat outside. Hmm. Um, you have time for one more question? Sure. Um, we got one last question. What does it mean when two cats chatter each other? Is Ooh, this yeah. playful or aggressive behavior? It can be a little bit of both. Um, so I definitely see it like cats chatter when they see prey or they're excited. So I think that in some cases it is an excitement type behavior and it can turn into, um, you know, I think the, the thing with clay and I think, you know, I don't talk a lot. I mean, I do talk in the book about play between cats, um, but I didn't really talk about it all tonight. And you know, the thing is that one cat may be playing, but the other cat is not. And so play is not always mutual. And in that case, um, you know, the cat who's chattering may be like, I'm about to pounce on you. You look like a nice, you know, I was like, joke about it with my own cats. So like, you know, they just see the other cat as like a great mouse or whatever. And, um, you know, the cat who is the victim of that, you know, perception is not interested in being attacked or being pounced on. So, um, so it can be playful, it can be predatory, and you just kind of have to know your cats and keep an eye on them and make sure it doesn't escalate. Okay, well, okay. um, I see the breeze thanks. comment. So yeah. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so okay, um, great. Thank well, you, thank everybody you, everybody. Yeah. And Thank you, Michael. Um, and uh, please check out our social media for our upcoming events. And um, the winner of the contest will be announced soon. We have two books to give away. So um, be on the lookout for an email. And um, thank you again. Please check out Michael's book. Um, we have a uh, ebook copy in our library, and hopefully we'll be getting the physical copy soon. So. Um, yeah, thanks again, and uh, have a great night, everyone. All right, good night, everybody. Thank you for being here. Thank you.